we make a very serious error, in my opinion, if, when we f tend to focus on one region of the world. So, you know, if people are interested in Southeast Asia, they look at Southeast Asia. If they're interested in the Middle East, they look at the Middle East. Uh, that's overlooking the fact that the U.S. is a global power. And what it's doing in one place, it's usually doing in another place because they grow out of the same basic principles. And the case of the Middle East is not an exception. You want to understand what's going on, you have to look at it in a much more global framework, focusing attention on planning in Washington, uh, which since the Second World War has dominated most of the world. The uh, perpetrators, I assume, like everyone else, are probably Al-Qaeda or some group very much like them. And uh, as for their motivations, I think we have a good understanding. They've been very clear about it for 20 years. Uh, not these same individuals, but others like them. And their words correspond to their actions, so there's every reason to take them seriously. Uh, the, nobody knows them better than the CIA because it helped uh, organize and recruit them and arm them and train them, dealt with them for years. In fact, the same special forces that are chasing them around uh, the caves in Afghanistan are the ones that trained them in the 1980s, so I'm sure they know all about them. Uh, and they've been very clear about what their intentions are. Uh, bin Laden is the most eloquent spokesperson, and uh, uh, he, what he's been saying for years is uh, we're going to drive uh, the infidels out of the Muslim lands, and we're going to turn these lands into uh, what we call pure Islamic states. So our main enemy is Saudi Arabia, because they're not a pure Islamic state, and the other corrupt and brutal states of the region. Uh, they were, of course, opposed to the Russians, who, as far as they're concerned, are indistinguishable from the Americans, just more infidels than Muslim lands. As for the Americans, uh, they turned against the United States when, from their perspective, the United States was occupying Muslim lands by putting permanent military bases in Saudi Arabia, which is much more important to them than Afghanistan. Uh, and that's been a consistent position for a long time, 20 years. I mean, their first terrorist act was uh, assassination of President Sadat back in 1981. Notice, not the same individuals, but the same sort of networks and uh, you know, groups. Uh, so that's what they've been saying, and that's what they've been doing. I have every reason to take it seriously. They tried to blow up the World Trade Center in 1993. That was a very ambitious plan. They were planning to blow up the World Trade Center, the UN, the FBI building, the tunnels uh, into New York. Uh, that one, they were caught in time. The, if you can believe the U.S. police criminal system, the perpetrators are in jail. Uh, one of them is a Muslim cleric uh, who was instantly brought into the United States over the objections of the Immigration and Nationalization Service by the CIA, by CIA intervention, because he was a friend of theirs and they wanted him here. Uh, and when he was here, he organized terrorist cells which tried to blow up the World Trade Center. Uh, so those people we see, so uh, Sheikh Rahman is not the same as bin Laden, but you know, there's a kind of community of similarity. Uh, and there's pro a shared conception. So I assume that's the perpetrators. And I agree with the world's intelligence systems that those are their reasons, and um, there doesn't seem much doubt about that. Uh, then comes the second question. What about the reservoir of s sympathy and sometimes support, uh, at least acceptance of many of their alleged goals? So that's the whole region. Uh, why is there hatred against us there? George Bush's famous question. Well, everyone knows the answer to this. Uh, a couple of days after the, I mean, I have to distinguish two things here. Uh, there's a category of people called intellectuals. Their task is to make up fabrications uh, that protect power uh, and divert attention from what's obvious and indoctrinate people and so on. And they've concocted all sorts of complicated stories about globalization and, you know, failure to enter the modern world and this, that, and the other thing. Okay, we, and they envy us because we're so wonderful, et cetera, et cetera. All right, we can put all that aside. That's standard propaganda. Uh, let's talk about what is plainly the case uh, and is, in fact, discussed by serious people, like, say, the Wall Street Journal. 
so a few days after the september eleventh the wall street journal to its credit began running serious stories in which they investigated opinions of people in the islamic world who they are interested in, what they called moneyed muslims the ones with the rich ones, the important ones so bankers, international lawyers, directors of multinational corporations people who are right inside the u.s. system who certainly have no opposition to what's called globalization in fact they're part of it who certainly hate bin laden because he's trying to kill them you know but who nevertheless agree with much of what he says uh, and what they say is, their opinions are, that uh, the United States supports brutal and corrupt regimes which uh, block democracy and modernization and development. Uh, they oppose particular policies like the decisive U.S. support for the 35-year uh, op uh, military occupation of um, Palestinian territory, which has been harsh and brutal and relies crucially on U.S. military and diplomatic support. When you read in the newspapers that Israeli helicopters and jets are attacking Palestinians, that's total fabrication. U.S. jets and U.S. helicopters, which happen to be piloted by Israeli pilots, are attacking those concentrations. That's what ought to be said. Israel doesn't manufacture helicopters and, or F-16s. Uh, and uh, they understand all that. Uh, they know that the U.S. has been blocking any diplomatic settlement for actually for 30 years since Sadat offered one in 1971. It's not reported here and in the West it's not talked about much, but they know it. Uh, the, uh, and uh, they know what's going on there. They also know perfectly well that uh, the U.S. and Britain are carrying out operations against Iraq which are devastating the civilian society and strengthening Saddam Hussein. And they also remember, as Westerners like to forget, uh, that the U.S. has no, and Britain and France and Holland and so on, have no opposition, objection to Saddam Hussein's crimes. We know that for sure, because they support, supported Saddam Hussein right through the period of his worst crimes. You know, gassing the Kurds, uh, Anfal, uh, chemical weapons. They continued to support him very happily. He remained a good, favored friend and ally of the West, which helped provide him with the means for developing weapons of mass destruction when he was really dangerous. So they listened when Tony Blair and Madeleine Albright condemned Saddam because you know, the ultimate monster even gassed his own people. They listened, but they add the words that are excluded in the West. They say, yeah, he committed those crimes with your support. Okay, rather crucial omission, which you never hear from Tony Blair and the rest. Uh, but they are not that indoctrinated, so they remember that those elementary truths. And those are other reasons why, if you want, there's hatred against us. Furthermore, there's absolutely nothing new about this. Uh, anybody who wants to understand any of it knows exactly where to go. You go to the declassified U.S. record. The U.S. is a very open society. We have declassified records of internal deliberations from the past. All these questions came up decades ago. So in 19, and I had the same answers. Uh, in 1958, uh, crucial year for many reasons, uh, look, I'm now talking about internal records, uh, the U.S., so the Eisenhower administration, discussed three major crises for the United States. One was Indonesia, one was North Africa, third was the Middle East, all Islamic countries, all oil producers, uh, the question arose whether the Russians were involved. That was dismissed as ludicrous, no Russian involvement. Uh, it's just independent nationalism in the three countries, which was the main crisis. Uh, then Eisenhower pointed out, with regard to the Middle East, in his, his words approximately, he said there is a campaign of hatred against us, not by the governments, but by the people. Uh, and that, that was an issue that was discussed. No globalization, you know, no, they hate us because we have McDonald's and none of this stuff. Uh, why is there a campaign of hatred against us? Well, the National Security Council discussed it. That's the highest analysis and planning body. And they said uh, the problem is that there's a perception among the people of the region that the United States supports uh, corrupt and harsh regimes which prevent democratization and development, 
and does so because of its interest in controlling Near East oil. And they said it's hard to counter this perception because it's true. Uh, and furthermore, it should be true because we should uh, support those regimes in order to maintain our control over Near East oil. So therefore, it's, there is a campaign of hatred against us by the people who see that we're robbing their resources uh, and preventing democracy and development. But you know, we can't do much about it because that's what we ought to be doing. Uh, well, you know, like I say, no McDonald's, no envying us our magnificence, uh, no globalization, just perfectly obvious things. You know, same reason why there was a campaign of hatred against England from the people of India or against Holland from the people of the East Indies and so on and so forth. Yeah, you crush people under your boot, they don't like it. So there's a campaign of hatred against you. In fact, what they, what they were discussing internally in 1958 is the same as what the Wall Street Journal found in, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2001, you know, uh, and for the same reasons, because the policies haven't fundamentally changed. So that's so we understand. Uh, I mean, the Wall Street Journal only was concerned with elite opinion. If they'd gone down to the slums of Cairo, they would have gotten stronger opinions, but of the same kind, and more different ones also. Because in the slums of Cairo, they wouldn't like the fact that the wealth of the region is going to the West and not to the people of the region. Uh, the ones who the Wall Street Journal was talking about are quite happy about that because they're part of the ruling elite and they enrich themselves while the resources go to the West. So they're part of the imperial system. So you get different opinions if you bother to ask uh, people in the so-called streets. Uh, but fundamentally it's the same. So there's a camp, so there, so Bin Laden's messages certainly resonate and people agree with a lot of the things he's saying. Uh, about 80% of Egyptians, for example, say that the most important issue to them is uh, the crushing of the Palestinians. So when they hear bin Laden say it, they agree. It has nothing to do with whether they like him or hate him. Uh, on the other hand, there is a clique of uh, terror, uh, radical Islamists who were organized and trained and brought together by Western intelligence for their own purposes and have continued to do for 20 years just what they've always said they were going to do. So. While some things are obscure, I don't think these are obscure. I think the answers are quite transparent. The uh, proper topic for an occasion like this, I suppose, is pretty obvious. Uh, it would be uh, the question of how the media have handled uh, the major story of uh, the past months. And there's no question about what that is. Uh, that the question, the issue is uh, the war on terrorism, so-called, and specifically in the Islamic world. And so by media here, I, I intend the term to be understood pretty broadly, so including uh, journals of uh, commentary, analysis, uh, opinion, in fact, the intellectual culture generally. Uh, it's a really important topic. Uh, it's been reviewed regularly by FAIR, by others. Uh, however, it isn't really an appropriate topic for a talk. And the reason is that it requires too much detailed analysis. So what I'd like to do is take a somewhat different approach to it uh, and ask the question, uh, how should uh, the story be handled uh, in accord with uh, general principles that uh, that are accepted uh, as uh, guidelines, so principles of fairness and accuracy and relevance and so on. Uh, let's approach this by kind of a thought experiment. Uh, imagine an intelligent Martian. Uh, incidentally, I'm told that by convention, uh, Martians are male, so I'll refer to it as he. Uh, so suppose that this Martian uh, uh, went to Harvard and uh, Columbia Journalism School and uh, learned all sorts of high-minded things and actually believes them. Uh, how would the Martian uh, handle a story like this? Well, I think uh, he would begin with some uh, factual observations that he'd send back to the journal in Mars. Uh, one factual observation is that uh, 
the war on terrorism was not declared on September 11th. Uh, rather, it was redeclared uh, using the same rhetoric uh, as the first declaration 20 years earlier. Uh, the Reagan administration, as you know, I'm sure, came into office announcing that uh, a war on terrorism uh, would be the core of uh, U.S. foreign policy, and it condemned what the president called the evil scourge of terrorism. Uh, the main focus was state-supported international terrorism in the Islamic world, and at that time also in Central America. Uh, uh, international terrorism was described as uh, uh, a uh, plague uh, spread by depraved opponents of civilization itself in a return to barbarism in the modern age. Actually, I'm quoting the administration moderate, uh, Secretary of State George Shultz. Uh, we, uh, uh, Reagan's particular, the phrase I quoted from Reagan actually had to do with the Middle East. Uh, it, uh, terrorism in the Middle East, and it was in the year 1955. Uh, that was the year in which international terrorism in that region was selected by uh, editors as the lead story of the year in an annual uh, AP poll. So point one that our Martian would report uh, is that uh, the year 2001 is the second time uh, that this has been the main lead story uh, and that the war on terrorism has been uh, redeclared uh, uh, pretty much as before. Uh, furthermore, there's a striking continuity. Uh, the same people are in leading uh, positions. So uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who's uh, running the military component of the second phase of the war on terrorism, uh, he was Reagan's special envoy to the, uh, to the Middle East uh, during the first phase of the war on terrorism, including, including the peak year, 1985. Uh, the uh, person who was just appointed a couple of months ago to be in charge of the diplomatic uh, component of the war at the United Nations is John Negroponte, uh, who during the first phase was supervising U.S. operations in Honduras which was the main base for uh, the U.S. war against terror in the first phase. Current history has an issue on terrorism it, with various scholars. Every single one of them talks about the motivations. Did they condemn them? No. What they're condemning is critics. They say critics should not be allowed to raise questions. Uh, the reason? We have to silence criticism because everyone has to line up and sing hosannas to our leaders. That's the job of intellectuals. Round up the chorus so they all sing praises to your leaders while they march in the parade and tell you how magnificent we are. I mean, that's the historic task of intellectuals, you know, not just here. I mean, it's a historic task. I mean, let's go back. Uh, say to World War One, you know, far enough away so we can think about it. Uh, what did intellectuals do during World War One? Well, you know, first thing that happened is 93 leading German intellectuals published a manifesto calling on their colleagues and the rest of the world to support Germany and its magnificent uh, aim to bring justice and peace to the world. Uh, what did the West, the Europe, American intellectuals do? Exactly the same thing. You know. In fact, they all lauded their, the magnificence of their own leaders. There were some exceptions. Uh, most of them ended up in jail on both sides. Uh, so in Germany, uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht objected and were in jail. In England, uh, uh, Bertrand Russell objected. He was in jail. Uh, in the United States, uh, Eugene Debs is the leading figure in U.S. labor in the 20th century in a socialist presidential candidate, he went to jail for raising mild questions about Woodrow Wilson's war. Uh, and, and others were just repressed, you know, like Randolph Bourne was kicked out of all of his journals and so on, uh, because they didn't join the parade. And intellectuals are supposed to join the parade. And they do. Uh, exceptions are so rare, you know, you can practically list them. I mean, there are exceptions. Uh, and there are honorable ones. Actually, most of them are in the third world. Uh, 
give you quite a few. Uh, but in the West, most intellectuals are very loyal and submissive. Uh, and uh, what you're hearing is not, don't talk about motivations, because, they, because they're very selective. As I say, Wall Street Journal is okay, you know, current history is okay, uh, uh, the Yale University volume on Age of Terror is okay. It's critics who are not allowed to raise motivations because critics are not allowed to exist. Okay. So therefore they're not allowed to do what other people do or in fact do anything. They have to join the parade. Uh, we've passed the point where you throw them into jail in the West, but you try to get rid of them in other ways. By vilification, by lies, by defamation, and all the various techniques that intellectuals know very well. It's part of their you know, métier. Uh, so that's what you're hearing. And you, and you can see that you're hearing that by the selectivity. So we don't have to bother with the argument because it's idiotic. Uh, of course, if you're serious, you're going to try to find out the motivation of the Nazis too. I mean, anybody who's serious about Nazism, of course, is going to ask about the motivation. I mean, it's not even a question. Is that justification of them? Of course not. It's just elementary rationality. A good Martian reporter would also want to clarify a couple of uh, basic ideas. Uh, first of all, he'd like to know what exactly is terrorism? And secondly, what's the proper response to it? Well, whatever the answer to the second question is, uh, that proper response must satisfy some moral truisms. And the Martian can easily discover what these truisms are. Uh, at least as understood by the leaders of uh, the war, what the self-declared war on terrorism, because they tell us, they tell us constantly that they're very pious Christians uh, who therefore revere the Gospels and have certainly memorized uh, the definition of hypocrite uh, given prominently in the Gospels. Uh, namely, the hypocrites are those who apply to others uh, standards that they refuse to accept for themselves. So the Martian understands then that in order to rise to the absolutely minimal moral level, uh, we have to agree uh, and in fact insist uh, that if some act is right for us, uh, then it's right for others. And if it's wrong when others do it, uh, then it's wrong when we do it. Uh, that's the most elementary of moral truisms. Uh, and once the Martian realizes that, uh, he can pack up his bags and go back to Mars uh, because his research task is over. Uh, he would be unlikely to find a phrase, a single phrase, in the vast coverage and commentary about uh, the war on terrorism that even begins to approach this minimal standard. Don't take my word for it. Uh, try the experiment. Well, I don't want to exaggerate. Uh, you can probably find the phrase now and then way out at the margins, though very rarely. Uh, nevertheless, this uh, moral truism is recognized within the mainstream. It's understood to be uh, an extremely dangerous heresy, and therefore it's necessary to erect impregnable barriers against it, uh, even before it's anybody exhibits it, even though it's so rare. In fact, there's even a technical vocabulary available in case anybody would dare uh, to uh, engage uh, in the heresy, to involve themselves in the heresy that uh, we should abide by moral truisms that we pretend to revere. Uh, the offenders are guilty of something called moral relativism. Uh, that means the suggestion that we apply to ourselves the standards we apply to others, or maybe moral equivalence. That's a term which was invented, I think, by Jean, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick to ward off the danger that uh, we might, somebody might dare to uh, look at our own crimes. Uh, or the term, uh, or maybe they can be called, uh, involved, they're, uh, 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 they're carrying out the crime of America bashing or they're anti-Americans, which is a rather interesting concept. As far as I'm aware, the term is used elsewhere only in totalitarian states, uh, for example, in Russia in the old days, where anti-Sovietism was the highest crime. Uh, if somebody were to publish a book uh, 
in Italy, say, called uh, the anti-Italians. Now you can imagine what the reaction would be in the streets of Milan and Rome, or in any country where freedom and democracy are taken seriously. Uh, but let's suppose that uh, the Martian isn't deterred by the inevitable tirades and stream of vilification, and uh, suppose he persists uh, in keeping to the most elementary moral truisms. Well, as I said, if he does that, he can just go home. Uh, but suppose out of curiosity, uh, he decides to stay on and look a little bit further. So what will happen? Well, back to the question, what is terrorism? Important one. Uh, now, there's a proper course for a serious Martian reporter to follow to find the answer to that, uh, since the, look at the people who declare the war on terrorism and see what they say terrorism is. It's fair enough. And there is, in fact, an official definition uh, in the US code and army manuals elsewhere. Uh, it's uh, defined briefly, terrorism, as I'm quoting, is defined as the calculated use of violence or the threat of violence to attain goals that are political, religious, or ideological in nature through intimidation, coercion, or instilling fear. Well, that sounds simple. As far as I can see, it's appropriate. But we constantly read that uh, the problem of defining terrorism is uh, very vexing and complex. Uh, and the Martian might wonder why that's true. Of course, the same is true for those who are victims of vastly worse terrorist crimes. Uh, but that's reported only on Mars. So you might try to find a report, say, of a conference run by Salvadoran Jesuits a couple of years ago. Uh, the Jesuits, uh, their experiences under US international terrorism were particularly grisly. Uh, the conference report stressed the residual effect of what it called the culture of terrorism, which domesticates the aspirations of the majority, who realize that they must submit to the dictates of uh, the ruling terrorist state and its local agents, or they'll again be returned to uh, the Central American mode, as recommended by the doves at the peak of the state-supported international terrorism of the 80s. Unreported here, of course, uh, maybe headlines on Mars. Forgetting everything that's been said, rising to minimal levels of morality, let's try to answer the question. Uh, well, we can start by asking, uh, how should a um, long series of countries around the world react to Western state terrorism? So to take, just take one uncontroversial case. How should Nicaragua react to U.S. terrorism against Nicaragua? I mean, that case is uncontroversial because we have a world court decision and we would have had a Security Council resolution except that the U.S. vetoed it. Uh, so it's uncontroversial and is much worse than September 11th. You know, tens of thousands of people killed, you know, country practically destroyed, may never recover. So how should Nicaragua have responded to uh, U.S. terror? Well, one possibility is to bomb Washington. Does anybody believe that's the way they should have responded? Uh, another might be, say, bioterror. Another maybe assassinate the president. Anybody believe that that's a proper response? I mean, I've never seen anybody believe it. I certainly don't believe it. Okay, but if we don't believe that that was a right response to our atrocities, uh, then it's not the right response to their atrocities. Uh, particularly when it's people who didn't even do it, like the people in Afghanistan had nothing to do with this. Uh, the, uh, so, so the real question is, should uh, Nicaragua have set off bombs in, I don't know, Oklahoma or something? It's ridiculous. So therefore, the entire Western response by Western standards is totally illegitimate. In fact, uh, let's take contemporary terrorism. Uh, plenty of it. I mean, September 11th was a terrorist atrocity. So was the reaction to it. Uh, literally, literally, by the literal meaning of the word terrorism as defined in US official documents. Terrorism is the calculated use, threat or use of violence to achieve political or other ends through intimidation or fear. All right. Suppose you announce to people, we're going to continue to bomb you unless you turn over to us people who we suspect of crimes 
though we're not going to provide you with any evidence and we're going to refuse negotiations. I'm quoting George Bush. That's terrorism in the literal sense, extreme terrorism. Or let's go on a couple of weeks later, a few weeks later, uh, end of October, the U.S. and Britain changed their war aims. They shifted it to change, overthrowing the regime. So uh, Admiral Boyce, the British Minister of Defense, announced uh, to the people of Afghanistan, we are going to, you have to understand that we're going to continue to bomb you until you get your leadership changed textbook illustration of terrorism. Okay, what's the right response? Is it to assassinate Bush and Boys? To bomb the United States and England? No, it's not. Uh, so any of the responses that are taken are obviously illegitimate, at least if we rise to minimal moral levels. Well, how do you deal with it? Well, actually there are proposals that make some sense, uh, like the Vatican, you know, those radicals in the Vatican or um, take, say, Foreign Affairs, you know, the main establishment journal. In the current issue, it happens to have published an article which was actually written in October by Michael Howard, who's the preeminent Anglo-American military historian. He's got all the right credentials, very supportive of the British Empire, thinks the American Empire is even more wonderful. So, perfect person. Uh, well, uh, and a major military historian. What he says is, in the case of a criminal conspiracy, which is what this obviously was, uh, the right approach uh, is to uh, carry out careful police investigation, uh, find evidence as to who the perpetrators were. Uh, if it's international and you have the evidence, go to an appropriate international authority, which could be, say, the Security Council, uh, under their authorization carry out actions, if, if, he, if they won't turn them over to you, which they might have, uh, under their authorization, carry out actions to find and apprehend the perpetrators, bring them to an international tribunal where they can get a fair trial. Okay? Well, that's an approach. And in fact, if we take that approach seriously, we would do the same thing to Admiral Boyce, uh, Tony Blair, George Bush, uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, uh, George Bush the first and uh, anyone else, uh, the people who are running the current war on terrorism like Donald Rumsfeld who was uh, Ronald Reagan's special advisor to the Middle East when they were terrorizing the whole region, uh, John Negroponte who's running the diplomatic side of the current war on terrorism and was the proconsul in Honduras organizing the Contra armies attacking Nicaragua for which the U.S. was condemned by the world court. Yeah, right down the list. We would do the same thing to them. Uh, that's assuming that we could reach minimal levels of moral, uh, of moral integrity. And of course, all of this is so remote from anything that you can even talk about in the West uh, that it's hard to say the words. But then there's an elementary conclusion that follows from that. Everyone in the West, and I have to include myself here because I don't propose this either, everyone in the West is such a total hypocrite uh, that for them even to talk about questions of right or wrong is a disgrace. Well, suppose uh, finally uh, that we join the Martian Observer. I'm skipping a lot of things I think are interesting. You can ask about them if you like. But suppose finally that we join the Martian Observer uh, and uh, we depart from convention radically. Uh, we accept moral truisms. Uh, if we can rise to that level, uh, we can then, and only then, uh, honestly raise the question of how to respond to terrorist crimes. Uh, one answer is to follow the precedent of law-abiding states, the Nicaraguan precedent, for example. Of course, that failed because they ran up against the fact that the world is ruled by force, not by law, but wouldn't fail for the U.S. However, evidently, that's excluded. Uh, I have yet to see one phrase referring to that precedent in the massive coverage of uh, the last couple of months. Uh, another answer was given by Bush and Boyce, but we instantly reject that one because nobody believes that uh, Haiti or Nicaragua or Cuba and a long list of others around the world have the right to carry out massive terrorist attacks against the United States and its clients or other rich and powerful states. Uh, a more reasonable answer uh, was given by a number of, from a number of sources, including the Vatican, and was spelled out 
uh, by the preeminent Anglo-American military historian, Michael Howard, last October. Actually, it's published in the current issue of Foreign Affairs. That's the leading establishment journal. Uh, Howard has all the appropriate credentials, a lot of prestige. He's a great admirer of the British Empire, uh, even more extravagantly of its successor in global rule, so he can't be accused of moral relativism or other such crimes. Uh, referring to September 11th, he, uh, recommends a he recommended then a police operation against a criminal conspiracy whose members should be hunted down and brought before an international court uh, where they could receive a fair trial and if found guilty be awarded an appropriate sentence. Well, that was never contemplated, of course, but sounds kind of reasonable to me. Uh, if it is reasonable, then it ought to hold for even worse terrorist crimes. For example, the U.S. Uh, international terrorist attack against Nicaragua, or even worse ones nearby and elsewhere, going up right to the present, incidentally. Well, that could never be contemplated, of course, but for opposite reasons. So honesty leaves us with a dilemma. Uh, the easy answer is conventional hypocrisy. Uh, the other option is the one adopted by our Martian friend, who actually abides by the principles that we uh, profess with grand self-righteousness. Uh, that option is harder to consider, uh, but imperative, uh, if the world is to be spared still worse disasters. Thanks. Uh, immediately after the September 11th atrocities, one thing was obvious. I mean, I don't say it in retrospect. I said it the first time I was asked a question by reporters on September 12th. It's in print. What was obvious was that every harsh and repressive force in the world would see this as a window of opportunity to pursue their own agenda more relentlessly uh, while people are either frightened or distracted or um, suppressed by um, obedience or something. And that's happened all over the world. I mean, exactly how they did it depended on the country. So in Russia, the way they did it was by intensifying their atrocities in Chechnya, assuming correctly that the West would let them off the hook. So Germany would say, well, you know, not so bad, and the United States would kind of help them out in Georgia and so on. Uh, Israel did it by harsh, sharply intensifying repression in the territory. Uh, Turkey did it by uh, starting a wave of repression against intellectuals and others. Actually, I was just there for a political trial, which is one of those cases. And so uh, India did it by harshening it, by making its uh, repression harsher in Kashmir. Uh, uh, the more democratic countries did it by you know, various devices they call Prevention of Terrorism Acts, which have nothing to do with terrorism but have a lot to do with making the population more submissive and obedient and silent and marginal uh, while they push through their own agendas. And their own agendas are the old ones, but now they have an opportunity. So for the Bush administration, it's important to cut capital gains taxes and taxes for the wealthy uh, so that you transfer wealth even more to a narrow sector of rich and powerful uh, to push through international economic agreements that they know the public's opposed to and can't manage when the people are looking uh, to destroy the environment for in which our grandchildren might survive uh, to vastly increase uh, military programs uh, which include really dangerous ones like militarization of space uh, and certainly this is not the military-industrial complex, that's a misnomer. Uh, High-tech industry generally exists under the cover of public subsidies that come largely through the military system. Everyone at the institution you're now in knows this because it pays their salaries, my salary for example. MIT is one of the funnels by which the public is deluded into paying the costs of high-tech industry. Uh, the, almost the entire so-called new economy relies on this. Uh, they now can do it uh, uh, under the fear of terror. So the, in the last couple of years, there's been a very sharp increase in public expenditures at the National Institute of Health and so on for the biology-based sciences. Reason, that's the cutting edge of the new economy. 
for the future, it's going to be biology-based. So you have to enrich pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies and so on, and they don't want to pay for it. They want the public to pay for it. Uh, now it can be done under the cover of bioterrorism. So there'll be another big increase, uh, you know, to another big public subsidy to biology-based corporations uh, under the cover of bioterrorism. So it's not the military, and there is no military-industrial complex. It's just the industrial system operating under one or another pretext. Uh, defense was a pretext for a long time. Uh, so yeah, they try to ram that through. Uh, and many other policies which are, uh, which are extremely harmful to the general public. I mean, it probably will devastate uh, what limited social support systems there are, like me Medicare, uh, you know, uh, um, Social Security, and so on. In fact, it's happening right at the moment. Like uh, just yesterday, Bush announced the um, high tariffs for steel, right? Uh, but with a couple of little provisos, there is nothing in them for the steel workers who are thrown out. Uh, when corporations declare bankruptcy and their stockholders and CEOs go off and enjoy themselves with ton tons of money, the steel workers lose their not only their jobs but their pensions, their health care, uh, their benefits, and nothing goes to them. Uh, the uh, and the same is true of you know everything else. Take a, take a look at it. There's a sharp assault against the population and against democracy under the cover of you got to be patriotic while I relentlessly pursue my own objectives. So you shut up and I'll be more energetic than I was before. Yeah, of course they're, they're trying that. And it's the same in every country. So yes, here and everywhere else, uh, the window of opportunity was perceived and is being used. Let me personalize it against Jews. I mean, when I grew up, as a kid, we were Jewish. Uh, Anti-Semitism was a very, very uh, visible phenomenon. I mean, I grew up in a part of a middle lower middle class section of a city where we were the, happened to be the only Jewish family in an Irish and German Catholic neighborhood, which were mostly Nazis, pro-Nazi, pretty openly. And uh, you know, I grew up with a visceral fear of Catholics. I mean, it wasn't until I was an adult that I could deal with Catholics and somehow not be afraid. Uh, but it wasn't much fun, you know. And when they came out of that Jesuit school, you know, they were frightening creatures. Uh, furthermore, when my father finally got enough money to get a second-hand car and we could drive around a little, uh, if we'd get to the nearby you know, mountains, we'd have to look for a motel because a lot of motels had on them restricted. That means no Jews, you know. Uh, when I got to Harvard, in 1950, the anti-Semitism was so thick you could cut it with a knife. In fact, one of the reasons MIT here is a great university is because a lot of uh, first-rate people like Paul Samuelson and Norbert Wiener couldn't get jobs at Harvard because they were Jewish. In fact, Harvard uh, got their first Jewish mathematician, you know, it's a Jewish field, while I was there, 1953, because the department was so anti-Semitic. I mean, this all changed in the 50s. But up until that time, anti-Semitism was perfectly overt and very real. Uh, and the Jewish community was subdued. You didn't want to be too visible, you know, because uh, you got enough problems. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, uh, refugees from the Holocaust didn't come here. You know, I, almost anybody in Europe, certainly people in the DP camps, would have been delighted to come to the United States. They didn't. Uh, refugees from the people who were sim were dying in the DP camps after uh, you know after the Germans were defeated they were still there and it wasn't very nice in fact it hadn't changed much except for the crematoria weren't going uh, they didn't very few of them came to the United States partly because of anti-Semitism partly because the Jewish community didn't want them didn't push to bring them here uh, and for reasons that are you know not pretty but are understandable. And we've got enough problems. Uh, the uh, uh, anti-Semitism is no longer a legitimate form of racism. Anti-Arab uh, bias is a legitimate form of racism, meaning you don't have to hide it. Okay, most forms of racism, you have to pretend you're not a racist. So you have to pretend I'm not an 
I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm not anti-black. You may be, but you don't advertise it. Uh, Anti-Arab racism, you're allowed to advertise. Now, this is way before September 11th. And the uh, community, uh, you see it in films and books and attitudes. It's just not even hidden, you know. I mean, nobody will come out and say, I'm an anti-Arab racist, but it's in, you know, it's everywhere. And every Muslim or Arab in the country knows it. Okay. Uh, now, after September 11th, I should add that this shows up in behavior, too. So for just to give you an illustration, Boston happens to have a big Lebanese community. And while they're not super wealthy, they have money. You know, they're storekeepers and businessmen and so on. Uh, in 1982, at the time of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which was a total horrible atrocity, uh, a few of us made an effort to organize just a charitable relief program for people in Lebanon. Uh, we could not get any support from the Lebanese community here. And I think I understand why, because I remember it from childhood. I think they just don't want to be too visible. And I think that's understandable. I can't prove that, but that's the sense that I had. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's not just, uh, since September 11th, it's, yes, it's increased, but uh, not only Arabs, but I mean, anybody who looks a little bit dark. I mean, look, Europe was the most savage part of the world for 500 years. Uh, and part of the reason Europe conquered the world is that it had a culture of savagery that was beyond anything that anyone saw anywhere else. That's why small European armies could conquer, you know, big groups. Partly they were ahead in the technology of war, but partly it was just the culture. In fact, if you look at military historians, what they say is uh, uh, in the rest of the world, war was a sport. In Europe, it was a science. Uh, in fact, Europeans for centuries, uh, their prime concern was to slaughter one another. Uh, that was part of the imposition of the nation-state system in Europe. It's a brutal, murderous system. Everywhere it's been imposed, it's been a disaster. Uh, it took centuries to impose it in Europe, and it's centuries of savagery. I mean, it's not just the 20th century. I mean, one 17th century war it wiped out about a third or 40 percent of the population of Germany. Uh, so, yeah, it's an extremely savage civilization. Uh, it extend, expended its atrocities all over the world. And if anyone resisted elsewhere, they went berserk. I mean, when there was an Indian rebellion called the Indian, in England they call it the Indian Mutiny, uh, there was a rebellion of Indians in uh, uh, 1857, uh, the British went totally berserk. I mean, they practically wiped the place out, you know, uh, and uh, it was supported. You know. I mean, there was some criticism in England, but most of the intellectuals supported it. Uh, the, uh, and the same elsewhere. You just don't harm Europeans when they kill you in your country. You know, it's not allowed. Uh, Boxer Rebellion was a case in point, too. I mean, the West went berserk. Chinese were defending themselves. I mean, they committed atrocities. You know, everybody commits atrocities. Uh, but, the, uh, but the atrocities were in their countries. You know, they weren't in England or Holland or Germany, you know, Belgium. They were there, uh, and they had to be slaughtered there. Uh, what's different about September 11th is, for the first time in history, the atrocities took place in Europe and its offshoots. Now, September 11th was a horrible atrocity. Uh, but it wasn't new. Uh, there are plenty of atrocities like that. It's only that they take place somewhere else. Uh, this is the history of Europe for hundreds of years. We commit those atrocities regularly and much worse ones against other people, but they don't do anything to us. Uh, there's no, nothing in the history of Europe and its offshoots like the United States uh, in, in, in which I mean, there were cases where Europeans uh, were killed and there were atrocities against Europeans, but they were in other countries, not at home. With very marginal exceptions, the conquerors of the world were immune. September 11th destroyed that total immunity, uh, destroyed the total monopoly on violence. The overwhelming predominance, of course, remains, but not the monopoly which is why it's so shocking. 
Well, let me turn to the, my main topic, uh, our role and responsibility by our here. I mean people who are citizens of the United States and have share responsibility for what it's doing and should be asking what they can do to overcome uh, the crimes that the U.S. is supporting. In many countries, Israel's only one. I happen to have just come back from Colombia and Turkey, some of the worst human rights violators in the world. The situation there is far worse, even in the occupied territories. Uh, and I talked about these things there, and as I do here. And people often um, object that it's unfair to criticize them. Uh, they point out that they themselves are living under terrorist threat. And in Colombia and Turkey, there's no doubt that that's been true far more than in Israel. Uh, and they say, therefore, it's unfair to criticize them. Uh, and the, that, what they say is in part correct. Nothing justifies their terrorist, the terrorist atrocities that they carry out, which are horrifying. Uh, but it's true that the criticism ought to be directed here. They are all acting with decisive U.S. support, military aid and support, diplomatic support, ideological support, which means covering up what happened or giving apologetics for it. And the United States, as essentially the ruler of the world, uh, sets the limits within which they can operate. And they'll go to the limits. Uh, almost any country would when authorized by the uh, chief mafia don. Uh, and it's uh, therefore at home that, uh, to ourselves that the criticism should be directed if we're honest about it. I am, actually, more than in the past. There are a lot of good things happening. And it's very striking how they cannot be perceived. So, for example, the, uh, the New York Times business pages a couple of days ago uh, had an article on uh, Anderson, you know, the, comp the company that's caught up in the security scam, and it mentioned in it th that all of this falls under the General Agreement on Trade and Services, GATS. And then it said, interesting comment, it said, it said no one has objected to GATS, although there has been a lot of protest against merchandise trade. Well, in fact, GATS has been the leading theme of protest of the popular movements for years. It's a major topic in Porto Alegre this year and the year before. It was a major topic at the protests against the Summit of the Americas in Quebec in April. It's been a topic in all the forums for a very good reason. It's a, ter it's a horrifying attack on democracy, and the public knows it. The correspondent is not lying. That's what he reads in his own journals. That's what he hears from his friends in the elegant restaurants that he goes to, or the faculty clubs, or the editorial offices. So in this little cocoon, yeah, that's probably the way it is. And there's a principle of the press, principle that's rigid. You cannot report what protesters are saying. The only thing you can report is if you can find somebody throwing a rock somewhere, you can report that. But you can't report what they're saying. And therefore, if it happens that what they're having is extensive discussions about GATS, you won't know. So he's telling the truth from his point of view. And within the cocoon of intellectual life, that's what the world looks like. I mean, that's why you see headlines saying there's no dissent in the United States. It's not like the Vietnam War. It's precisely the opposite, dramatically. I mean, during the Vietnam War, the war went on for years before there was any protest at all. I mean, it's 40 years ago that Kennedy attacked South Vietnam. It took years before you could even have the minimal protest. Now, you know, at, uh, thousands of people at meetings and demonstrations, I go home tonight and spend an hour, as I do every night, just turning down invitations. Because it's way beyond what it's ever been before. But you can't know that within the cocoon. And you can't let other people know it either. You have to make them think they're alone and isolated. So inside the system, did you change it? By having people elected, by having no, people elected? No, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, if you can get a senator who's a nice guy, that's better than having a senator who's a rotten guy. But there are very sharp limits on what you can do. I mean, these are institutional facts. I mean, like, say, take a corporation. I mean, suppose the chairman of Ford decided to cut back profits and to use them to improve working conditions and to make safer cars and you know put resources into you know ten cars ten years from now that won't 
wreck the environment and so on, uh, what what will happen to him? Well, for one thing, he ought, probably ought to be put in jail because it's illegal. Uh, he, his, he has a legal responsibility to maximize profit and market share for his shareholders. Well, he wouldn't be put in jail, but he'd surely be kicked out. And somebody else would replace him who would do the right thing. And in fact, if by some miracle he did do what he set out to do, he'd be out of business in a year uh, because uh, his competitors wouldn't be doing it, so they'd be underselling him next year. I mean, these are institutional facts. I mean, the individuals in charge may be, you know, very nice to their children and friends and give a lot of money to charity, uh, but it doesn't change anything because they have to act within uh, an institutional framework which requires vicious activity. You're head of a corporation, you've got to be an immoral monster, otherwise you can't survive as the head of a corporation. Uh, if you're part of a state system, you're part of the mafia. And the international affairs runs like the mafia. You know, it's power systems that get away with whatever they can. Uh, the United States is more violent because it's more powerful. I and mean, if Andorra had U.S. military force, they'd be doing it. Uh, that happens to be the fact about the way the world is. Well, the world can change, and it has changed. So, for example, no American president now could even dream of doing what John F. Kennedy did 40 years ago. 40 years ago, John F. Kennedy bombed, started the bombing of South Vietnam, the use of chemical warfare. People are dying still from, from it, uh, driving millions of people into concentration camps. There wasn't a peep. You couldn't get two people to talk about it. It was years before you could even have a public meeting about it. That's inconceivable today. The country's gotten a lot more civilized. And not because, uh, you know, the, gov the president's got more civilized. Uh, it's because of the popular movements. You know, a lot of ferment in the 60s developed much more in the 70s and the 80s. And it just changed the culture. And that's the way to change things.